Hi, welcome back. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about chapter three, theater spaces, and highlight the different kinds of spaces that people do theater in, um, basically breaking down the different categories that the author of our textbook has designated as sort of the five types of spaces. But first, I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, why is space important to theater? Well, space creates the kind of feeling that the spectator or audience experiences. It also contributes to what the actors do and the kind of feeling that they convey. A, a space that has, say, gilded columns might invoke a different kind of feeling for the audience member versus going into a theater space that's just brick walls or going to see a show that's outside in the open air. All of those types of different spaces create a different kind of experience and event and whether or not it's um, removed or maybe the aesthetic distance is, is greater or maybe it's a more intimate, almost participatory type of experience for an audience member. So space is really important, not just for the audience in terms of what they're feeling and the experience that they have, but also the kind of plays that are produced and the kind of space that that play happens in. So the first space I want to talk about is the proscenium theater. Now the proscenium theater is by far the sort of um, most normative or normal space. It's um, probably the most um, popular space in both Europe and the US. So it's a sort of Western type space, or I, I should say Western theater influence. And partially because it comes out of the Greek space and the Roman space. Um, proscenium itself just is, is a Greek term that means proscena, or in front of the scene. And the Romans really sort of created this sort of picture frame and then through the Renaissance and coming forward, the proscenium started to move forward and the stage space started to recede. Um, during the Renaissance, the stage space was actually raked. And so what that means is that it was a slope. I think our textbook talks about the audience being on a, on a rake, but the stage floor was actually raked during the Renaissance. And so when an actor went upstage, they literally walked up the rake. When they went downstage, they literally walked downstage. So that's part of where we get our stage directions from. So stage directions are always from the actor's point of view. So if you're going to move left, you're going stage left, which is towards the actor's left, not the audience left. So if you move stage right, you go towards the actor's right, not the audience right. So stage directions, we, we usually break the stage up into nine sections and we have center stage, very center, and then we have center right, center left, up center, down center, upstage left, upstage right, downstage right, downstage left. Um, so those are basically our stage directions, so the direction in which an actor moves on stage. Now blocking, which is a different term, and we'll talk more about that next week, but I wanted to just talk about the differences between if we say stage direction versus blocking. Blocking is the movement that is either prescribed by the director or choreographer or music director or um, even the actor motivates sometimes their own blocking, but it's where they move, where the actor moves on stage and how they move. And then we have notation that an actor and a stage manager and a director will put into their script. So stage direction is telling the actor which direction to move and blocking is the actual movement that then gets written down in the script. So blocking might consist of an actor writing on this line, cross, down, stage, right. And then after this line, cross, up, stage, right. And so you use stage directions inside blocking and blocking is sort of the category of the overall movement. All right, getting back to stage spaces. So stage spaces, I've talked a little bit about the proscenium um, theater and, and that it comes from the Greek word proskena. 
um, which means in front of the scene, but today really the proscenium theater just means a picture frame, right? It's, it's a sort of tableau or picture frame arch that the stage is set inside of. The proscenium theater by nature of its um, spatial relationships is more in tune with say observed theater than participatory theater because there's a distinct distinct um, space that separates the audience from the performers and we we sometimes call that distinction the fourth wall so another way to describe a proscenium theater is a fourth wall theater because in theory this idea that there's this box and we're looking through this fourth wall and observing what's happening on stage. So that's what a proscenium theater is. Now, other types of theater spaces that our text has indicated um, are arena stages. Now, arena stages, um, kind of like what you might experience in a sporting event or a concert, means that, it, that the audience sits almost like in a circle or oval type. Um, arrangement around the stage, so it's surrounding the actual um, action. I'm going to stop for a second because my dog is barking. Hi. Okay, so I'm back. So I think I was talking about arena stages. Arena stages are spaces that are arranged in a circle. Um, there was a movement after World War II where theaters were building the arrangement as arena spaces. There's a famous national, well, famous theater in Washington, D.C. called Arena Stage, which is literally in um, the round. But it's a, it's a well outf outfitted theater. It's not necessarily, doesn't mean that it's like bare bones in terms of the technology that's in the space. However, because it's not a proscenium theater, Flying scenery, moving scenery on and off stage is less um, feasible because you have audience on all sides. So that means the staging ends up being more simplified in terms of things like scenery. However, emphasis of lighting certainly happens um, as well as uh, sort of ingenious ways to move elements around the space to create different looks. So that's really what an arena stage is. Now a thrust stage just simply means that the stage floor, the stage space actually thrusts out into the audience. Sometimes we call it three quarters, um, but typically what you find with a thrust stage is that there's a sort of proscenium type space behind the thrust and that the thrust is a sort of exaggerated apron or an element of the stage that extends out. Sometimes thrust can be really extreme where you have literally almost like an arena style or maybe it's just a small element of the stage but the main component is that the audience is on three sides and that that stage space sort of thrusts out into the audience. It's sort of a nice combination of proscenium and arena because you can actually have scenic elements behind what the actors are doing. However, for those audience members who are on the sides, they don't have the same um, viewpoint that if you're looking straight on that might um, background an actor that's similar in a proscenium type space. So that's a three-quarter stage. So then it brings me to uh, the black box. So the black box is what's considered the most flexible space. There is no sort of um, exact kind of black box. Sometimes they are literally square, sometimes they're rectangular. Sometimes the audience can be set up in a more like proscenium, tile, proscenium type of arrangement where the audience is on one side and the stage space is on the other and the audience looks straight on. Um, a black box could be arranged like a thrust or it could be arranged in three quarters or all the way around. So there's, um, so the point to the black box space is that it's reconfigurable, that it's more simple most of the time and that it is flexible. They can sort of be found spaces but usually they're spaces that have been converted into a theatrical type of 
performance space so that you have lighting, you have um, maybe an area that's designated as backstage and that the audience has proper seating in a sense, doesn't mean that a black box can't also be experimental. Which then brings me to the other kind of space um, that our textbook talks about, which is found spaces. Now found spaces include street theater because you can just literally walk out into the street, you find that space and perform. Or site-specific spaces such as uh, airport hangars um, or large warehouses, even parks, places like that can be considered found spaces. What designates, say, a found space, uh, what makes it different than a black box or an arena or that kind of space is that typically you're not trying to hide the space that you're in itself, that that space does contribute to the performance or even um, occlude any kind of illusion. So, so a proscenium theater really elevates and helps create the theatrical illusion, I-L-L-U-S-I-O-N. Whereas a found space, there's no illusion being made because the space itself is very overt. So you can't get rid of, like if you're performing in a park, that space is a part of the experience. So a found space is literally that. It's a space that you find. Um, so the next section I want to sort of talk about a little bit is the Greek theater space, because for most theaters that are constructed, they are really, they, they have a lineage that comes from the Greek theater space. So Greek theater spaces were typically built into hillsides, right? And this is what was so amazing about the Greeks is that they understood the, the acoustics of a space that if you build a theater into a hillside and that you use a certain kind of stone for the seating that you can actually focus and send the performer's voice to the audience in such a way that it doesn't bounce around but that it hits the audience where it's supposed to and then gets absorbed into the actual stone causing less reflection. So if you ever go to Greece you must visit uh, Theater Epidaurus, which is uh, one of the few remaining just grand, beautiful spaces. And you can literally stand center stage and speak in this, this level of voice and be heard at the back of you know, this 3,000 seat space. So a Greek theater space has um, several components. Um, I think I've already mentioned the term theatron, which is where the audience sits, and it literally means a seeing or viewing place. Then the orchestra, which is a circular space, almost like what we would now call the stage space, was actually where the chorus would sing and dance. So orchestra, as a Greek term, does mean dancing place or playing space for this chorus. Then the skene, or scene, is a building that the Greeks used to for several things. They could hang backdrops, they could have periactoys, which were a sort of a revolving triangle pieces that could change scenery, and they were platforms for actors to stand on. So particular characters like gods or goddesses would stand on there and look larger than life than other characters that might be standing down on the ground in front of the skene. So this Skene building um, also facilitated costume changes. And then you had these two sort of um, entrances and exits, stage right and stage left of the orchestra, which is where the chorus came in and out of. So those are the sort of main components of a Greek theater space. And um, I'm gonna post a link of, about the ancient Greek theater space that goes into a little more detail than what I just spoke about. And so please watch that. Then the other kind of theater space I want to talk briefly about is the Elizabethan stage. And the reason why this is so important uh, is kind of twofold. One, we still produce Shakespeare. Um, there are Shakespeare festivals all over the world. And so the Elizabethan stage is a space that we want to kind of look at because Shakespeare wrote his plays to be played in this type of space. Not to say that we have spaces like this all over. 
but you can go to London and experience a Shakespeare play in the rebuilt globe that is fairly accurate historically, pretty interesting. So, so when you look at Elizabethan stage, and we're going to look at the globe as an example, what you have is a space that is circular, but you have a thrust space with a, a sort of stage building at one end, and then the audience that's an extreme three quarters. You have a space that's on the ground that audience members would stand in, and those were the cheapest seats, even though they were kind of the best seats. And those particular, um, the people who stood in these spaces were called the groundlings. And those were, um, which can be used as a slur because in theory, those are the cheapest seats. So those would be where the poorest people were in the audience. But um, it's also kind of fun to think about um, that the comedy troupe has named itself the groundlings after this sort of um, specific uh, interaction that, that this audience that was down on the ground surrounding the stage could be really interactive with performers on that thrust stage. Then you had box seats and the gallery seating set that came up and around and those were the more expensive seats because they were covered so if it were raining you wouldn't get rained on. On the Elizabethan stage on this thrust you had trap doors and so you could have actors entering from underneath the stage you had a, a sort of fly system that could bring actors down from the heavens so you could have particular characters that uh, say ghosts or even like Ariel and the Tempest could enter that way and you had very little scenery because the stage space itself accommodated different kinds of staging. So you had a balcony that could uh, be used for Romeo and Juliet, say something like that. Um, I'm going to post a short video and also um, include an image of a sort of artist rendering of 